Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Denver and Boulder Java user group meetings. I'm Greg Ostrovich, and uh, as a reminder, we're always looking for Java user group speakers. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. If you want to speak, um, please email uh, Matt Rabel, uh, myself, or send a message to the meetup group and let us know if you want to speak or if you have a topic that you want to speak on. Uh, as always, we do our housekeeping announcements. If you need the restroom, hopefully you can find it because you're in your house or your office. Um, Tech Systems is our food sponsor, but uh, because we're in these COVID times, uh, tonight's dinner is sponsored by whatever is in your pantry and your fridge. Uh, we do want to thank uh, Andrew Rawson, a Rawson at TechSystems.com for his sponsorship. Reach out to them if you have some staffing needs. Uh, another sponsor is, I'm letting the slides catch up, another sponsor is JFrog. Um, our sponsor JFrog has their monthly sweepstakes, but they're also doing an extra giveaway tonight. So let me introduce Ari Waller to tell you all about it and about JFrog. So Ari. Hey, thank you so, thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. I'm Ari Waller, and I'm the Meetup Event Manager for JFrog. And we're really proud to be sponsors of the Denver Java User Group and really happy to be here tonight for the joint meetup between Denver and Boulder tonight. So thank you. For those of you who don't know, uh, JFrog was founded in 2008 and is considered to be the DevOps software company. We're known by many for our flagship product, Artifactory, which is written in Java. And today we have 600 employees and 10 offices globally, and more than 3 million developers use our software on a daily basis. What a lot of people don't know, though, is that we have created free access to our cloud-based DevOps platform, especially for the community. You can get your hands on this for a project that you're working on, and there's real, no credit card or expiration date, frankly. And these tools include Artifactory, as well as vulnerability scanning, and some other really cool toys for you to play with. So I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat a little later about that. But what's more exciting to me tonight is that uh, we get to give out not just a monthly sweepstakes to all of our meetups that we sponsor, but frankly, this is just for the Denver and Boulder Java user group tonight. Um, you're going to um, hear from James shortly, but one of the exciting uh, things that we have is we're giving away a pair of Apple AirPod Pros. Um, there is a QR code which you can scan, and there's also a bit.ly, which I'll also drop in the chat shortly, and you can enter to win this. Uh, also, for those, um, if, if for those uh, who may not win that, we're going to also give away five really cool JFrog t-shirts too. So uh, there's a good chance for you to win something tonight if you enter our raffle. And um, I will select the raffle winner. It's not something we'll do live, but we'll select the raffle winner within three business days. And you'll be contacted. And of course, we'll notify uh, both of the Java user groups on who the winner was. So uh, it's really exciting to be here tonight. Uh, I want to thank all the leaders for what you do for the community. And um, looking forward to uh, reaching out to the winner for the AirPods. And uh, Greg, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Ari, and good luck to all our participants tonight. Um, may the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> so uh, next up, another sponsor we have is Apex Systems. Uh, Braden uh, Collip is our sponsor with that. Um, they usually sponsor beer, but tonight your beer or drink of choice is sponsored by whatever's in your fridge. I got my little uh, chilada right here, so or me chilada. Um, so please support Apex Systems if you're looking for staffing. Another sponsor that we have is Develop Intelligence. Um, Ace uh, Ven Juan Seal is uh, our main contact with them. They are a training company, and they're always looking to hire uh, technical instructors who specialize in several technologies um, for contract opportunities. Those include Java, GoLang, JavaScript, React, DevOps tools like Kubernetes and Docker. We might even have a talk on that tonight and many others. So reach out to Jarrett, J-E-R-E-T, at developintelligence.com. Amazon is another sponsor, and we really appreciate their support. And uh, reach out to Chris Almond or Sam Ayer uh, if you are interested in going to work for them or need to talk to them about whatever. Um, another sponsor that we have is Okta. Uh, they sponsor the Meetup site that we use. And um, they completely help us run this online meeting. It's because of Matt Rabel, who works for Okta, that we're able to do this. And we really appreciate Okta, and we appreciate Matt and his support. Uh, another sponsor is NextGen. And that's uh, Beth and Sandy, uh, Beth Crowley and Sandy Holskin. Uh, Beth.crowley at nextgeninc.com. 
Uh, they don't have any openings right now, but check with them. And if you are looking um, and you have any needs, we do appreciate their support. Uh, they give us an Amazon gift card that we give away. And uh, thanks to Mike Azueta, who does all those giveaways that we do at the end of the meeting. So um, another sponsor that we have is Agile Learner. Uh, this is a Vencat uh, company, Vencat Subramanian. Uh, they're looking at re scheduling their uh, meeting because of COVID, they had to cancel their conference. Uh, but you can go to agilelearner.com and they do have a subscription that you can do. Uh, Venkat is awesome. He's a great speaker and we support them and their efforts. If you're looking for something it, concerning Agile, please check them out. Um, we also have our last sponsor is JetBrains. Um, IntelliJ is one of the IDEs we give away. It's kind of a suite now of things that support uh, Java and Python and other tools uh, for that IDE. But uh, JetBrains has been a sponsor for at least 10, possibly 15 years. And we really appreciate their support when we give away a, a couple of license every meeting. Um, we're still working out the kinks, but Mike is doing the door prizes. So um, I want to thank him for that. We really appreciate it. I think he's I, he might have it down now. I don't remember how it went last last time, but we really appreciate him taking the time to do that. Um, I want to thank Matt Rabel for doing this online setup and for doing the speaker locations. Uh, Mike for doing those door prizes and Zeddy Chinfung who does all the operational stuff for the Java Users Group. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, Chris Woyna from the Boulder Java Users Group. He'd like to thank some sponsors and talk about some door prices as well. So Chris. Good evening, everyone. Um, just real quick to run through our sponsors. Uh, Tech Systems also, Anastasia Alexenko. Um, she's a fantastic person in the North Denver area and all the way up to the border. So if you have any questions about your career or you're looking or you're thinking, um, give Anastasia a call at Tech Systems. Uh, also, Rule 4, uh, they were last year's Colorado Technology Association winner. Uh, they're uh, huge in cybersecurity and emerging technologies. No fluff, Jeff Buff, Jay Zimmerman. Uh, they do a lot of training and conferences. And, of course, Agile developer, Venkat Subramanian. Uh, we have a door prize tonight. Uh, uh, a, sub a video subscription for his site. So um, since we're not really able to do raffles, the first person that um, contacts me through the, the meetup site tonight, I'll, uh, I'll forward that to you. We also have uh, an IntelliJ uh, IDE uh, license from JetBrains. So again, first person to contact me gets that. Um, normally we have books from O'Reilly and back to you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, so tonight's presentation, um, comparing Docker image build methods, uh, cloud native build packs, uh, JIB and Docker. Um, I'm personally really excited because at, I work for the state and we've been doing more with um, DevOps. Uh, we haven't been using Docker containers as much, but we might ramp up into that. We do have some projects using Docker and Kubernetes. And so this should be really great. Uh, Docker images are the deployment artifacts in modern platforms, Kubernetes, Cloud Run, et cetera. There are a number of ways to create those images from source, Docker Build, the JIB Maven, and Gradle plugins, um, or cloud native build packs. This session will provide an overview of the different methods and compare them to help you understand which you should use. Tonight's speaker, uh, James Ward is a nerd and software developer who shares what he learns with others through presentations, blogs, demos, and code. After over two decades of professional programming, he is now a self-proclaimed type pure functional programming zealot, but often compromises on his ideals just to get stuff done. After spending too many sleepless nights in data centers repairing RAID arrays, he now prefers high-level cloud abstractions with appropriate escape hatches. Uh, James is a huge open source proponent, hoping to never get burned by lock-in again. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at underscore James Ward. And without further ado, uh, our presenter tonight, uh, Mr. James Ward. Thank you, James. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody, for having me. I uh, wish I could be with all of you in person. Uh, I'm up in Crested Butte, Colorado, so not too far away from Denver and Boulder, but glad that at least now this can be broadcast all around the world. So 
Um, thanks for joining me. Uh, so yeah, so I didn't know you're going to go through my whole bio. It's kind of funny. Um, I I think I wrote it in a in a fit of rage or around some sort. But um, but yeah. So, so um, okay. So tonight we're going to go through the different containerization methods that you can use, and we're talking specifically about Docker OCI containers. And uh, let me give a little bit of background about what that means, and then we'll dive in. And I'm not going to do any slides. Just all kind of live demos tonight. And I think that we have a way for you to ask questions. I think uh, Matt Rabel is going to interrupt me periodically with questions. Is that right, Matt? That is correct. Awesome. So how do people ask their questions tonight? So if they just do it in the actual comments on YouTube, then there will be a delay, right? There's like a 15 or 20 second delay, but we will get those and then I'll bring them up on the screen and interrupt you rudely and it'll be fun. And also, we should let everyone know that James is kind of a serverless guy. So every time he says serverless, you have to drink. That's right. We're doing we're doing our um, buzzword bingo for serverless, right? And what other buzzwords should we have? Um, I think that one's going to be plenty. <laughs> we're going to get pretty sloshed just with serverless. All right. We'll see how we do. OK, so uh, to get started, a little bit of background on containers. Many of you probably remember the days when we would take our Java applications and package them into WAR files or EAR files, and we would put them inside of a container that was our JBoss or WebLogic or WebSphere container. And that, that uh, Java archive WAR or EAR would contain all of the class files that our application needed to run. And because we're running in a Java container, it was able to take that archive and run it on the JVM inside of the container and use the APIs that are available in the container and that sort of thing. So that was all great and, and worked well. But then we moved into this polyglot world where we needed to support things other than JVM applications. So we needed to support uh, applications built with Python and Ruby and Node and PHP, my favorite non-purely functional language that I've built a lot of production systems in and all sorts of other things. Uh, or maybe we needed more sophisticated bindings to the operating system. And that got a little challenging with our Java archive uh, deployment method. We needed to depend on some native library or something. And so what happened was we started coming up uh, as an industry, we started coming up with ways to, to kind of take that paradigm that we had of containerizing an application and running it inside of something that can run a container and started doing that in some different ways. And so the, the history that I remember uh, when I was at Heroku was Heroku had a way to do this. Uh, they, uh, the container archive, the thing like the war file or ear file was called a slug file. File, and it was really just a zip file that ran in something called LXC, the Linux containers. And so, uh, so that provided the ability to run this, this little thing inside of a sandboxed area with constraints around CPU usage and memory usage and that sort of thing and file system access. Uh, so applying constraints to what that thing can do. But it was an operating system level package. And so that allowed us to run anything that runs on, in the case of Heroku, Ubuntu, uh, as the that base image for LXE, can then be run inside of a slug file. So that opened up a lot of opportunities. But we still had to have a way to, to go from source code. As developers, we work on source code. We still had to go from source code to that archive image. And so Heroku invented something called build packs. And uh, we're going to learn a lot more about that in just a little bit. Uh, but then, so that was that was kind of the my at least next evolution in going from the Java containers to, uh, to LXC containers. So then uh, a little bit later, there was a competitor to Heroku called .cloud. And .cloud was trying to solve similar problems as Heroku around containerization. And how do you package up an application and, and run it in a sandboxed way? And so they uh, ultimately invented something called Docker. And Docker was just another way and an open source way to create these container images, these, uh, these archives that had what's needed to run inside of something, something that can run the container. And so .cloud created essentially Docker, which included the way to 
to uh, define the containers, what they are, how they're structured, and then the way to run them in a virtualized environment. Docker originally started with LXC like Heroku, uh, but then moved to, uh, um, spacing libc, lib something c, uh, I forget the name of the containerization met uh, method that they switched to. Um, but that allowed them to be cross-platform more easily because it wasn't tied to Linux. Okay, so that's our brief history on uh, how we got where we are. So ultimately where we're at today is that we're still producing these archive files that contain everything that's needed to run in something that can run the container image. And so Docker is one of the tools that we can use to produce the containers and also run the containers. We can also run those containers on Kubernetes or on a variety of other services that support running containers. So let's uh, let's dive into an application that we're going to be working with tonight uh, that I'm going to be going through all the different container containerization methods on. So I've got a basic project here. And we've got a palm file. I'm using Maven. We could also use Gradle and, and have uh, exactly everything else, everything I'm going to show you tonight. And this Maven file is not very exciting. We have a way to exec our, uh, our main server app. We have a way to build a jar file. So pretty basic palm file. Then we have our web app Java file with our static void main. And what we're doing is uh, getting our port, creating an HTTP server, and then we're setting it up. So if it gets a request to slash, then we're going to respond with hello world and a status code 200. So pretty, pretty simple application here that we're going to be working with uh, for most of our examples tonight. So let's actually take this application and just run it locally so that we can validate that it works. So I'm going to go over into uh, the WSL uh, and run this. So there we go. Our server is now up and running. And if we go over here and go to our local host 8080, sure enough, we see our hello world. Great. So we see that our, our server works through the JVM. And that is not yet containerized. So the first method that we're going to use to containerize this is build packs. You'll see, looking at this project, there is nothing special in this project that talks about containerization. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a command using pack, which is a tool for using build packs. So I'm going to say pack build. I'm going to tell it which builder to use. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. I'm going to tell it which JVM version to use, 8. And then I'm going to say, uh, use this name, essentially, to store the outputted container as. So let's run that pack build on this, this project. So now what's going to happen is the pack command is, I did have to install that, um, but uh, the pack command is now using that builder image. And it, the builder image is downloaded to my local machine. That builder image, that gcr.io, let's see, let's go find that. Oh, my scroll back is not very far. That's a bummer. But that gcr.io uh, build packs builder v1, what that is, is a Docker container itself that contains a bunch of what are called build packs that look at this source code for this application and try to identify, OK, how do I take that source code and turn it into a container image? And what happened in this case was there is a build pack that knows Maven and Java. And so it looked and it said, oh, I see that there is a palm.xml file in that source code. And I know how to build a palm.xml based application using Maven. And so it just went and did that. It did our Maven uh, clean package. And, uh, and so that created our jar file. And it figured out how to execute that Java application. And so now what we have is you'll see the successfully built comparing Docker methods colon build packs. This is what's called uh, the tag there. So we put a tag on our container image. So we've got our container image now created by build packs. So the nice thing about this is that I didn't have to do anything to my, my project structure, my build. I didn't have to make any changes for it to be able to turn my Maven-based or Gradle-based application into a container. Uh, now, that's easy. It also works with, uh, let's see, Node, Go, uh, Python, um, .NET, and maybe forgetting one other one. Uh, and that's the that these are the Google Cloud build packs. There are other build packs out there as well. So you can use the Heroku build packs or you can use the Pivotal uh, build packs uh, as well. 
And so different build packs have different support for different things. For instance, the Heroku build packs support SBT. So if you're doing Scala, like I do a lot, uh, then you can use the Heroku build packs and it knows how to build SBT. Okay, so these are the Google Cloud build packs uh, and which we, we use to build this application. So the build packs are the thing that detected what type of application this was and then knew how to turn that type of application into the output, uh, which then goes into the container image. Okay, so we did our, our pack build. We've got our container image. Now let's go, whoops, I don't wanna run that again. Um, now let's go and run this thing with Docker. So let's say Docker run, and I'm gonna do a port binding so that, so that we can actually access this thing. So Docker run port 8080, and then I need my container image here. So let's paste that in. Okay. Now that container image is just on my local machine, but it's now run that container inside of Docker. And if I go and refresh this page, sure enough, it still works, but this time running inside of that Docker container. Okay, so that's great. We've verified that it was able to take my Maven project and turn it into a container image, and I'm able to run that container image. But let's go see what's actually inside of this container image. And that will help us understand a bit better what's actually going on here. So I'm gonna use a tool called Dive. And Dive, what it does is it shows us exactly what's actually inside of the container image. Container images are layered, and this allows us to have great caching for the different parts that compose uh, up what a container image is actually uh, created with. Uh, so all the different different kind of uh, layers that go into building up the file system, because it's just an archive or just a bunch of archive files. So all of the things that, that go into creating the final file system for our container image are all defined in layers. So we get great caching because what we could, what Docker can do and other tools can do is be like, okay, if nothing has changed that impacts this layer, then we don't need to re-pull down that layer. We don't need to rebuild that layer, that sort of thing. So this supports uh, great caching. Okay, so we've got our layers here and we can make some guesses looking at these layers and looking at the files that come in from that layer as to what's actually happening. So our first layer, our base layer here is 63 megs. So this is some base operating system. So this is a big difference from the ear files and war files that you may be familiar with is that we actually can give a Docker container uh, a whole operating system to, to inside of the container. And so this one starts with an operating system that's some Linux variant of operating system. And we can come over and, and see all the files that are actually part of that particular layer. But if we go back, now we can start to walk uh, up the layers. And I guess it's actually down the layers, but uh, walk uh, down the layers here and see what gets added at each additional layer. So there, now there's a 14 meg one. Looks like this is just adding in some more operating system stuff. And then we've got, for some reason, a, a kind of an empty layer here. And then a, another one for an operating system. Then another one that's adding in some other operating system bits. And then another one, more operating system bits. But then we get to this 205 megabyte uh, layer, which if we look at what is added there, it was the JVM. So great. So there we get a layer for our JVM. So this means if we don't change our JVM, then the things that are using this container image are not going to have to constantly re-pull if it's doing caching correctly. It's not going to have to re-pull this particular layer. It's going to just be able to pull this layer from cache. Uh, and only when we change the JVM layer, it would have to re-pull that particular layer. Okay, so we get our JVM layer. And then we get a layer that's 191K. And if we come over here and we can see now there's this workspace directory. And in this workspace directory, you can see my source code that was added. And then you can see my target directory, which contains my classes and the jar file, which for some reason is behind this menu. There's a bug and dive, um, but my jar file is, is in there. Okay, in that target directory. So you can see all that stuff came in in that that uh, that layer, um, this 191 kilobyte layer here. Okay, and that's compressed, 191 kilobytes compressed. Okay, then we've got another layer which adds in some stuff which we can go see. This is for the build packs. The build packs add some stuff that uh, create an easy way to run different entry points and define entry points within this container image. So those get added in by build packs themselves. And then there's another layer, this 496 byte one that adds in some additional metadata uh, for the, the build packs. 
Okay, so our total image size you'll see down here is 319 megabytes. So not that bad. I mean, definitely a lot bigger than than if I were just having a jar file that would be like the the 2.4 megabytes. Um, but the nice thing about this is that we have full ability to take this container image and run it in a lot of places. And we have flexibility where that we didn't have with jar files, your files, and more files was if we do need to do something at the operating system layer or the JVM layer, we can do that through the container image. Not, uh, And so we have the flexibility to do that when we need to. OK, so we've got our container image created with build packs, nice and easy to create. I want to show you uh, just an example of running this particular container image uh, on another environment. We ran it locally with Docker. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my pack command. And instead of telling it to use this local coordinates here, I'm going to tell it to use gcr.io. And then I've got a project called JW Demo. And then I'm going to tell pack to publish the output uh, uh, outputted image to that particular remote Docker registry. So with Docker, you have a local registry that contains container images or can, can store container images. And then you have remote ones as well. So Docker Hub is a remote container registry. So now I'm telling it, instead of building this to my local container registry, build it to the remote one up on Google Cloud. GCR stands for Google Container Registry. OK, so now that image is built. And because I said dash dash publish, then it should have been published up to that remote uh, repository. So if we go back to our browser and go over to our Google Cloud console, and you could, of course, do this to any Docker remote registry. It doesn't have to be just the, uh, the Google Container Registry. But let's go look in the Container Registry. And what we'll see if we scroll down is here is the comparing Docker methods, uh, Docker image. You'll see that here's the one that I just pushed just now. You'll see uploaded just now. Uh, Docker containers have this thing where they can have a date in them uh, for when they were created. And build pack set that date to, I think that's the Unix uh, uh, epoch, right? Um, something like that. Um, because if you don't set that to the Unix epoch, then you get unreproducible builds. Um, so anyways, we <laughs> built back set that to the uh, to that date every time. Okay, but that was uploaded just now. Okay, so we've got our container image. It's up on a remote registry. And then if we're on uh, Google Cloud, then we can run that on Cloud Run, on uh, Kubernetes engine, Google Kub Kubernetes engine, or just on a raw compute instance, uh, Google um, compute engine. I'm going to deploy this on Cloud Run just so you can see that Great thing about these container images is that they're portable. They can run in lots of different places. That same container image can run locally in Docker, can run on Cloud Run, can run on Kubernetes, all sorts of other places. OK, so let's um, let's go put in here my service name. And we'll call this one uh, dash jug. I'm going to allow unauthenticated invocations. And you'll see that it has those coordinates there for the GCR. Uh, address. Okay, so now it's taking that container image and it's running it on this, uh, should I say serverless? Uh, it, I haven't said it yet, I don't think. So time to take a drink if you're following along with our game. Uh, but there we go in our serverless uh, container based runtime called Cloud Run. And now we've got an endpoint for my application that was deployed from that container that I created with build packs. And if we go load that, then we see great, now we've got this service running on the internet and it works. Awesome. OK, so just to show you that, that you can run these containers, uh, container images wherever you can run containers. So OK, so that's our first method that I wanted to walk through was build packs. Um, and any, I'll, I'll pause here and see if there are any questions so far on build packs. Rabel, anything to? Um, to give me feedback on so far? <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. OK, so first of all, you got to bump your fonts in your browser. All right, bump a small. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. The other question is from Ed. Can you install PAC on Windows? Can you install PAC on Windows? I believe so. Let's go see. So if we go to github.com and then build packs slash pack, I think is the repo for pack. And we go to our releases. So there was just a release yesterday, 0.14.2. Let's go down to the downloads and see there is a Linux, a Mac, and a Windows distribution of pack. So the answer would be yes. Cool. 
Uh, the next question was up here. Oh, I lost it. Uh, from Stephen. I'm looking to learn if Docker layers can be jar files and then shared across different applications with the same set of dependencies to only require incremental memory usage. Uh, I'm going to get into using um, doing layer layering for that specific use case in uh, just a little bit. So so hang on for that one. I'll get into more okay. And the last one is uh, is Josh Long mentioning that you said PHP was your favorite non purely functional language. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. I love you, man. Continue. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, okay. So that was Docker files, and I was kidding about PHP, if, in case anyone is <laughs> curious about that. I, I have built a lot of PHP, but um, wouldn't say it was my favorite non-purely functional language. Okay. Um, so let's switch to a different branch in this repo. Uh, I was on the build packs branch, and I'm going to switch over to the jib branch. So let's check out this one. And what we're going to see if we look at the palm file for jib. So jib is a tool that can create container images. And it has plugins for Maven and Gradle. And I think there's other plugins for other tools. But it is a, a Java-based API for creating container images. So, uh, so in our Palm, what we have is now instead of that jar plugin, I don't have the jar plugin anymore. Now I have a jib maven plugin. So I added that in and you could use the Gradle one as well. Uh, but now I've got a build plugin that can do some more intelligent things around un understanding the structure of my build and producing different container images. So that's the only thing that I've changed is just added that jib plugin. So let's go and build my container image. And this time I'm gonna give it a different tag. So let's copy this over to here. Okay, so I'm doing my Maven compile, and then I'm doing my jib docker build, and then I'm telling it the image to store the output as. So that happened pretty fast. There's probably some, some uh, cache stuff going on here, but also there wasn't any dependencies for it to deal with. But it created my comparing docker methods uh, colon jib container image. And if we go and uh, let's just like run this thing, just like we ran the last one, just so you can see like, sure enough, it's going to work. So just like it did before, I'm going to change that that tag to, uh, to that. And oh, I've still got localhost open. So let's go refresh that. Sure enough, it works just like it did before. Great. So now let's, let's go take a look at uh, dive and dive into our container image so that we can see how jib structured this thing differently than build packs did. So first thing that we'll see right off is that our total image size for build packs, you remember was 315 megs somewhere around there. And with jib, it's already produced a, a lot smaller container image. 127 megs is the base image here. So if we walk through our layers, we can we can start to see what's going on. We've got uh, some base layers that are bringing in some operating system. This is a pretty small operating system. Uh, I don't know if it's BusyBox or or something along those lines, but a pretty optimized. I, I believe this is based on uh, distri the distrolist container images. So they're they're about as small as you can possibly get. Uh, no shell uh, things like that. Okay, so then we get to this 100 meg image. And if we look at our 100 meg image, we can start to see that, uh, let's see, user lib, I think is whoop, not that one, lib, JVM. Here we go. Now we get uh, jib added in a layer for our JVM, and we get the Java OpenJDK uh, image there. And it looks like this is the, uh, I think this is the distroless Java. Uh, which is trimmed down Java as well. So that's why it's only 100 megs instead of, I think it was 200 megs for the, the build packs one, whichever JVM it was pulling in, which probably has like the examples in it or something like that. You know, like the JVM like ships, ships with an examples directory or something, which has a bunch of like swing and AWT stuff in it. Uh, anyway, so they probably just cut that stuff out. We don't need examples. Okay, so we've got our JVM layer, uh, nice and small there. And then we have a layer here, which is our resources layer, which is empty because I didn't have any resources. So that's nice that it gives us a resources layer. And then we've got a uh, layer that 
that has just our compiled class files. So um, really concise. That's only 2.8 kilobytes here for that layer for our application. Obviously, this is a super small application. And so that's why we're able to, to get this down trimmed down uh, so small. But let's um, let's actually do this on a project with some dependencies. And so Josh Long is going to be happy because I'm going to switch over to Jib Spring Boot. And we're now going to run this again and see how this differs with the Spring Boot dependencies. So let's go and run this jib docker build. You'll see that I specified a different tag this time, jib dash spring boot. And so now you'll see it's built that new container image. And if we go dive into this one, spring boot, there we go. Then we'll see that, oh, now we've got this layer after the JVM that's 18 megs and it contains all of our jar dependencies. So this is back to the question from just a little bit ago, which was, what if I want to put my dependencies into a layer so that if my dependencies don't change, then that layer doesn't change and I get better caching? Well, Jib is just doing that for you. So certainly you could do that all manually and we'll get into manual stuff in a little bit, but by default with Jib, it knows because it's a build plugin what your dependencies are, and it puts them into a layer just for the dependencies. Then we've got our empty layer, which is our resources, which we don't have any. And then we've got our uh, layer here for our application. So um, so that's uh, that was how it was different with a application with dependencies. And you'll see we're up to a whopping 146 megabytes for this container image. But all these container images that we've built so far, they're going to run in Docker, they're going to run in Kubernetes, wherever you want to run your containers. Uh, so one of the primary advantages of JIB is that layering that it gives you. Uh, and, um, and so that allows you to have better caching with your dependencies, which you're probably going to have in a real world application, unlike the uh, one that I've been, been working with mostly today. So now uh, there is actually another way for Spring Boot applications that I should mention is that Spring Boot applications can actually be built with build packs without doing any work. So with Spring Boot, you can actually have this easy way of just running, uh, it's like maven boot uh, colon uh, I don't know, container image, Josh Long can correct me, I forget what the command is, but there is a task, what is it? Build image. Build image, thank you. Yeah, so that will actually, underneath the covers, use build packs to build your, your Spring application into a container image. So you don't need to do jib. Uh, and they've even added some great optimizations and done better layering and some of that stuff in uh, what's called the Paquetto build, build packs. And so super uh, great way to containerize Spring Boot applications in particular. So you can either use jib or you can use the build packs method. Um, so to, to recap where we've gone so far, build packs can be the super easy method, nothing needed in your build, but can sometime, sometimes have some uh, size, uh, can be larger than the jib produced images, that sort of thing, and may not produce the optimally layered images as well. But other than that, these images are, they're pretty similar. They have an operating system, they have a JVM, they have your application and, and the dependencies that it needs. Okay, so those so are our, here. yes, um, let's stop for questions. Can you also use multi-stage Docker build for what Jib is doing? We are going to get into Docker files in, next. So good lead into uh, what's coming next. So yes, you can, and we're going to show it next. Other questions? No, that's it. It's okay. just, uh, it's Josh and... Uh, Daniel Hanosa going at it in the comments. <laughs> we can just ignore both of them. Just kidding, guys. I love you both. Okay, let's switch over to the next method, which is uh, where we're going to go kind of back, which is to um, the, the original way to create Docker images, which is where we create this file called a Docker file. And the Docker file is a sequence of instructions that talk about how... Uh, Tell Docker how to produce a layered image. So let's look at this Docker file and then we'll run it and, and see how it works. So what I'm doing in this Docker file is I'm saying, all right, start with adopt OpenJDK, OpenJDK 8, and then I'm giving it this tag as builder. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, 
Uh, I need to copy my source code in. So I set up a work directory as slash app. I copy my source code into that slash app. Then I run my Maven command inside of Docker. So Docker is going to actually be running these instructions. So I, I tell Docker, run Maven W, compile jar colon jar. So that's going to create my jar file. So that, because I said as builder, is now in this, this uh, place where now we need to, to copy the contents of that into where we need it to. And so uh, so now we're going to create, this is like, um, this is like a, a working area, not actually what's going to go into our final image. So, but we do need to tell it how to construct the final image. So I'm going to say from adopt OpenJDK, OpenJDK 8, this time just using the JRE. And then I'm going to copy from my builder. So from the this kind of staging area here, I'm going to copy in the jar file that was created to slash server.jar. Every instruction, every copy instruction that happens in here creates a new layer inside of our, uh, our resulting um, uh, container image. And so this is how, if we had dependencies, back to the question, how we would create that, that uh, layered jar file with dependencies and that sort of thing. So it would be up to us to write the instructions so that it copied in the right files into the right places and did all that stuff uh, layered in the way that we wanted it to. And then I need to tell this Docker container how to actually start up my server. So job minus jar, my server.jar. Okay, let's let's go run that thing so that we can see how this is going to work. Let's do uh, Docker build, and then I'm going to give it a tag. We'll call it. Um, let's just copy and paste this tag here, and this is going to be Docker file is the tag, and then I'm going to tell it what I want to build, which is just dot the current directory. So now Docker is going through and it's running all these instructions. So it uh, in the builder part, it needed to to run that Maven uh, jar colon jar, but because this is running essentially in a container, not in not on my my uh, host operating system, it doesn't have my Maven cache, and so what it's doing is it's now downloading everything from Maven Central to be able to run Maven and actually perform that that jar jar uh, task. So that's going to take a minute to do all those downloads. Uh, you can mount in your, your Maven cache, uh, but it turns out you shouldn't because what happens is when things run inside of, uh, inside of Docker, they usually end up being written as root. And then when you try to use that stuff that's written as root as your normal user, then things get complicated. Um, so it's, it's hard to live in both worlds of outside of containers and inside containers. So I usually just let it um, download everything from Maven Central. Thank you, Sonatype, for sponsoring the uh, many, many downloads that I do and probably shouldn't need to do. OK, but you'll see that, all right, it created my jar file. And now it's assembling my final container image uh, from that OpenJDK 8 JRE. It's copying in my jar file, setting up the command. So now we have our tagged image here, comparing Docker methods, Docker file. And let's use dive to see what that thing looks like. OK, so. What we're going to see is our total image size now, 209 megabytes, not too bad. But you'll see that the open, I get some layers from my base image that I specified. So in my Docker file, I said from adopt OpenJDK, OpenJDK JRE. Well, that image is composed of multiple layers. And so I get those layers. So I get an operating system layer, more operating system stuff. Uh, who knows what all this stuff is doing? Oh, and then there's an app get update and install, which is installing like my CA certificates, some other stuff layer. And then I get this 110 megabyte image, which is my OpenJDK image. Um, so that's that layer. And then finally, my layer where I did my copy, and I copied from that staging area my server.jar file. And we can go see there. there's my server.jar file, 3.4 kilobytes. Nice and small there for that thing. OK. and. This is just a Docker container, so it can run everywhere, local Docker. I'm not going to go through all that, but can run all the places that you can run those containers. All right. Okay. So we, we got a few questions here. Yes. Uh, from Jonathan Curran, what other methods, tools are there that help build containers? 
he mentions Builda and Image IMG. Yes, there are others. Um, these are the primary ones that I've used. And I think if you're in the JVM ecosystem or not in the JV JVM ecosystem, it makes a difference. There's another tool called Scaffold that I think can also build container images. Um, so I've I've stuck with BuildPacks, Jib, and Docker files as the primary ones that I've used. Um, I'm sure that there are many others. Uh, because really these container images are just tar files with some metadata. So it's really not too incredibly hard to create them in a variety of different ways. But if anybody has uh, other experience with other container image creation methods uh, and how that would compare to these, um, definitely let us know in the comments. Here, um, here's a hard one. Yes. Do these Docker containers play nice with large middleware like Oracle 19C? Oh my God, that's a that is a hard one. Um, I have not used Oracle Middleware 19C. I used the last time I used an Oracle uh, container or application server was OC4J, and that was a long time ago. So great question. I don't know. Maybe one of our viewers knows the answer to that and could post the answer in the uh, comments for us. All right. Good question, Jim. Um, another question: Why might you pick one of those over Docker plus Docker file. Any reason to? Yes. So, uh, so I think Jim is Jib is great. It's nice and easy. Uh, provides great layering support. Um, and build packs is great if you don't want to do anything. You just want to give it some source code. Uh, so, the way that I look at it is, if you just want the totally easy option, use build packs. If you want to like add a build plugin and you're using something that supports jib then add the jib plugin and it's worth it uh then if for some reason that those options don't work for you then do docker files docker files are your escape hatch that give you 100 percent control over how that container image is created and allows you to do a lot of different stuff so for instance let's say that you you want to add in some native library into your container image that you need like you need some special encryption library or um, something that that is uh is not you're not going to be able to get through jib or build packs so in that case it's great to be able to drop down to a docker file to be able to have more control over how that container image is created so um so i'm going to actually show you an example next of why we would want to use docker file for exactly that something that we can't do with jib and can't do with build packs but before we go there let's see if there's any more questions one more question from dano <laughs> uh, he actually forgot what the uh, the local Maven repository's name is. He called it .mvm, but I think he means to say m2. .m2, yep. Right. yep. So can you use your local Maven repository? Technically, you can. So when you do Docker anything, you can, you can mount files into what Docker then uses. But it's a bad idea because usually and i think there's maybe some other ways to do this but uh but you, for most users docker runs as root and so what happens is is that you're gonna for some reason uh maven's gonna run and it's gonna store it's a read write uh volume and so this process is gonna store files from uh that it's pulled from the internet in your m2 directory and it's going to write those as root and then you're going to be on your system and you're going to be like oh i just want to like run maven w and run like clean and it's going to be like oh sorry you can't do that because i can't overwrite this palm file in the dot m2 directory or whatever it may be so so i i i haven't found a great way to handle reusing my local m2 cache in inside of what i do in docker um, technically possible just i haven't found a good way to make it work so maybe others have all right Post well that's comment. all the questions we have now so continue okay on. all right so uh so what is a place where we may want to have more flexibility than we got with jib or with build packs well let's switch over to another branch here which is going to be graal vm so GraalVM, as you may have heard, it uh, allows us to take a Java application and ahead of time compile it down to a native executable so that we don't need to use the JVM. We don't 
use the JIT and the JVM, uh, all that stuff that, that the JVM is doing for us gets pre-compiled down into a native executable. Now, this is cool and can work well in serverless environments. There you go. There's your, you can drink again. Uh, serverless environments where we may need to uh, start up quickly or starting up quickly is important because we've been scaled down and need to scale up quickly. And so GraalVM can be a great way to make it so our processes start really fast. We don't have the overhead of the JVM. And so we've seen servers uh, that are built in Graal VM start up in 10 milliseconds as opposed to many seconds. So it can be a really fast way to, to start up. Uh, and then we'll see some other optimizations that we can get in, uh, in a minute. Okay, so let's um, we let's take a look at our Docker file uh, here. So um, in our Docker file, we now have a lot more going on to support Graal VM. So I am starting with my builder and I'm using the GraalVM uh, distribution from Oracle. And I need to do a bunch of stuff to be able to build this application how I wanna build it. So first thing I need to do is install the native image tool. And I do that through a tool called goo or something. <laughs> and then uh, there's there's a couple different ways to create these GraalVM uh, Graal VM, uh binaries that are going to the GraalVM is native image is going to create and one of them the the kind of default one is that it's going to just bind to operating system libraries where it needs to so i it's like you know i need like a like a, a zlib library or something like that i'm just going to use the one that's in my container image and uh and so it uses what the ldd uh, library path or whatever it's called to figure out where those shared libraries are. So that's kind of the default mode. But there's a really cool other way that we can use GraalVM native image, which is we can actually take those, those uh, native bindings that we need, those native libraries that we need, and we can put them inside of our container, our, uh, our binary that's created from GraalVM. So we can just pack it all together. Everything that this thing needs, put it into one binary. But we do need to do some work to make that happen. So, uh, so this is that work that needs to happen. Is we're like downloading this Musil library. We're like building it with Make. Uh, so this is all running as part of our container build process. We're putting files in in certain places. We're building Zlib. Uh, so we've got the stuff that that we need to be able to do this static native image. Okay, but then we do our Maven compile jar jar, just like we did before. But then once we get our jar file for our application, then we can take that jar file and run it through that native image command, which we installed here in, as part of our, our Docker build process. And now I can specify some parameters, like let's make this a statically linked binary and let's give it the libc implementation that we just built up here. And let's specify some other parameters here, like the name, the jar file to use, the entry point, um, that kind of thing. Okay, so we're gonna run native image and that's going to do all of that ahead of time compilation to take that jar file and turn it into this, this native executable with the statically linked libraries all in that native image. Okay, so then here's where it gets cool is we've got our, our native image binary and now I don't need an operating system in my container. I say from scratch, scratch is an empty container image. I copy from my builder, the thing that was created from native image, which is this uh, app web app. And I copy that into slash web app and specify the command to run for, to run my container uh, just to run that thing. Okay, so let's go, let's go actually run this and let's go and see, I don't know why I lost my command there, but let's go run this and we'll see, uh, see what actually happens. Uh, so a little caveat, let's put in crawl VM here. A little caveat is that crawl VM is pretty, uh, the ahead of time compilation of crawl VM is pretty process intensive. So my audio and video may um, get a little flaky as Graal VM uh, uses all of my possible computing power to turn that jar file into a uh, binary with no dependencies on the JVM. 
So, okay, so you see what it's doing here is doing that uh, Musil C compilation so that so that uh, we can have those statically linked uh, libraries that it needs. And then it's gonna do the same thing for Zlib. And here we go. Um, there's Musil C is finished. Okay. Now Zlib, I think. Um, so this takes a little while. We're, you know, this is a couple minutes. It, you'll see that uh, jib and stuff happen pretty fast, uh, but this one's going to take a little while to run to create that native image because all that wonderful stuff that the JVM is doing for you uh, is now going to be done at uh, ahead of time instead of at runtime. So crawl VM native images are much more uh, suited for processes that need to start up quickly and don't run for a long time. Uh, if you've got processes that are gonna run for a long time, then you really can take advantage of the JIT and the uh, the warm JVM and all those optimizations that have gone into the JVM that was really kind of built around long running uh, Java JVM processes. Uh, but if your processes are not like that, if they're in a serverless environment where it's very static or very dynamic, scaling up and down very quickly, GraalVM can be a great option. Okay, and now is when I might get a little choppy because we are gonna, GraalVM is gonna perform all sorts of magic to turn uh, that jar file into our, um, into our static binary, statically linked binary. So it's telling us about the phases that it's going through. And I don't understand all the magic that's actually happening here, but you'll see it's, uh, it's taking a little while. It's doing a lot of stuff. And this is on a simple application. So I'll pop in and ask you some questions then. Uh, this one's from Ed. So does Jib generate the smallest images? Uh, depends on depends on what you mean by smallest images. So to answer that question, and now that it's done, let's actually do our dive into this container, and we can see what this particular container built with GraalVM looks like, and that will answer this question. So this container image is one layer and 11 megabytes for my entire application. So no JVM, no operating system, just one statically linked binary with everything that it needs inside of it and comes in at 11 megs. So that's the magic of GraalVM native image. There certainly are trade-offs to this. Like reflection is kind of hard. You have to configure reflection. It can be challenging. Uh, Quarkus and Micronaut and soon Spring Boot make that easier. Um, but things that you do reflection or dynamic proxies can be difficult because the native image ahead of time compiler needs to know ahead of time about uh, about those things. So, um, so you have to give it instructions on that. Um, another, you lose some of the debugability that the JVM gives you and that sort of thing. So, so this isn't all I should, I'm not saying, oh, it's 11 megs, always go this direction because it's the smallest you can possibly get. I think in some cases go this direction, but it's um, it's not something you you should always do because there certainly are trade offs to GraalVM native image. Okay, but just to prove that this thing actually works, let's let's actually go and run this thing, um, just so you can see that yes, the magic of GraalVM actually works. So let's run it. You'll see that you'll see how fast that thing started. Like it was instantaneous there. And of course, if we go and reload the page, it's going to work. So. So it sure it sure does work even with only one file, uh, 11 meg file in that container image. Okay, so that was something that we couldn't do through jib or build packs. That's something that we really needed to use the Docker file for. As, as you saw, there is a lot of instructions that are happening in here that, um, that are very custom, very specific to GraalVM and native image. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's uh, GraalVM native image stuff. Okay, back to questions. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> good luck answering this one. Can we convert a swing-based application to Graal VM native image? I think people have done that with, um, I'm not sure about swing. It seems like technically it should be possible. I know people have done that with Java FX. So people are still doing Java FX. It's still a thing. And, uh, and people are doing GraalVM um, with Java FX to produce native binaries. So um, I don't know how experimental that is, but, um, but, uh, but yeah. And, and I believe that native image, native, one of the downsides of this, so you can do the same thing with, with Go and with Rust and other things is create these, these tiny little uh, 
executables to put into container images. Uh, and Go and Rust have great support for being able to target different architectures and different operating systems when you do this. And it's as I tried to create a CLI with native image and the cross building got a little bit difficult. Uh, and so um, so I think the answer is, is probably you can do that, but it may not necessarily be an easy path. There's actually a couple of other technologies that have come out that, that may be better paths for that in particular. Uh, I think there was something added in Java 14, which make it easier to package the JVM with your application and create those executable packages. So it's not doing the ahead of time compilation, it's still running the JVM, but it makes it easier to do that packaging for you. And I forget the name of that, but I'm sure somebody can share in the comments. They remember offhand what the name of that particular thing that I think was added in, JD in uh, Java 14 was. We had a comment from Josh. He says, you can build native reactive or non-reactive Spring Boot apps with Tomcat, Hibernate, and tons of other stuff with that project today. Um, yes. So now we have good. So, real good point that I have. We're using this really bare bones application here. Technically, you can take Spring apps. You can take. Uh, oh, and I think Josh was pointing that out because I mentioned Micronaut and Corcus. Um, but, but yeah, technically, you can take any Java application uh, and use and run it through Native Image to create the native image for it. There are just some uh, tools like Micronaut and Corcus that have added uh, some tooling around making it easier to produce like the reflection configuration that's needed and that sort of thing. And I know that Spring Boot is working on on doing that as well. I think you can get to that in uh, like one of their um, next release milestones or something like that. So right, it's you can do it without that tool too. Right. It's just, you're gonna have to do a little bit of manual work around the reflection config. Yeah, so I played it with a little bit of that and you basically modify the Spring Boot plugin to add like three lines of code and then it'll generate a Grawl VM image for you. Nice. Instead of just a Docker container. And that's on the, the new version that's not fully released yet, is that it's right? It's on like uh, 2.4.0 to M2, and that I think 2.4.0 yeah. will be released like uh, second week in November. Yep, looking forward to that. It's gonna be awesome to have that built-in support for GraalVM. We got a good question here from Dano. Uh, you're doing the build in a Docker container because you're using a Mac and you need a Linux binary, but if you native build on a Linux, you should just be able to transfer the image or no? Uh, I think generally no. So I think if you I think if you run native image on on Mac, it's going to produce a native image for Mac. And if you run native image on Linux, it's going to produce a native image for Linux. I, I'm pretty sure that that's how that works. I I just use Linux. Um, well, God, I'm on Windows here, so that's not true. But I am in the Windows uh, <laughs> Windows subsystem for Linux or whatever. So really, I do just pretty much use Linux. Wow, you're presenting on Windows. That's uh, that's impressive. Well, it's better than presenting on actual Linux because, you know, who knows what it, I'm sure that the things would, would go wrong in that case, but, but I'm kind of in Linux. Well, technically I, when I run, well, so in my case, I'm actually running native image within Docker is where I'm running it. So, um, so that's even not, you can run native image on Linux or on Mac. And I think you can run it on Windows. Um, I'm pretty sure you can run it on Windows. So I, I think that when you run it on those environments, it outputs something for the, the environment that you run it on. But for my server processes, I always just run it inside of Docker. Uh, it's just the easiest way to do that. So you did mention uh, creating like a CLI with GraalVM and, uh, and my team's been working on it. I'm not sure how they build it, but they have been able to successfully create binaries for any OS, and uh, I think they've had a pretty good experience with that. Nice, that's awesome. So we got um, another question here, is the source code available anywhere? Gosh, everyone is just like leading me to everything. So absolutely, so if you go to GitHub, James Ward, and then comparing Docker methods, this is the repo that has this project in it, and then you'll see the different branches here for Dockerfile, Jib, Jib Spring Boot, Buildpacks, and Grawl VM native image. So all of the code and all of the configuration and instructions and everything is up there. All right, and now we have one more. Can you talk a little bit about GC options when using GraalVM native images? 
Oh, that is beyond my my knowledge of GraalVM. I don't know how it actually takes the GC and converts that to a non non JVM based GC. Uh, to me, it's all magic, but uh, but uh, they must have some way to do that. <laughs> okay, and that's it, except for Josh making comments about PHP. So you can move on. <laughs> Um, that's it. So if there are any other questions about anything, that's, that is the stuff that I wanted to show you, I guess to recap. Uh, so what I showed was build packs, the easy option and polyglot works on multiple different types of projects. There's jib, which is, uh, for Java based builds and is great for producing JVM, pretty concise JVM based layered container images. And then there's Docker file, which is your escape hatch for when you need more flexibility, you need to add in a native library that you can't do through jib or, or build packs, or, uh, you need to do crazy stuff like we did with Graal VM, uh, as part of your build pro container build process. So, um, so those are the, the three options that, that I've uh, used extensively and I use them all. So I think it's not a, not always, uh, always use this one. It's, um, you know, pick, pick the one that works best for your particular scenario. Other questions. All right. So there is a delay, right? Like I can say, ask your questions now and then 30 seconds later, someone will ask a question. So um, I did post something in the chat. So maybe someone will ask there. Um, but otherwise, thank you for keeping it like short and sweet because, you know, I know you could have talked for two hours. I appreciate that you just talked for an hour. So um, we have another question from Dano. I think the GC switches apply how it creates the native images, which works with the substrate VM. So that's more of an answer than a question. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. And congratulations, Dan, to your recent Java championship. All right, we'll put his uh, picture back up there because he's a handsome fellow. He was yes. right below us in New Mexico. That's right. Yeah. And we have Dan Hildebrand said, thank you, James. D-Jug and B-Jug. And um, since no one's asking, I think we'll give everyone some time back and hope you all enjoy your evening. Thank you, James, for joining us and stay strong. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Denver and Boulder Jugs for having me. Take care.